All right, welcome. In this video, I want to show you how you can add some keyboard input to your game if you're implementing a game using an HTML5 canvas element like I've been doing in my series of videos here. What I want to look at in this particular video is how I've added the keyboard input. Uh, and I've added this little debugging help up at the top here that keeps track of which buttons I'm pressing at which time, which makes it a little bit easier to debug. I didn't actually use this for my debugging, but you could use this to make sure you're capturing your inputs properly. And we're, I'm just going to show you how I've set this up and then also how maybe I've captured some of the inputs for use with my character Mario. So I want to start by looking at the game engine itself. Now, when we were looking at the game engine earlier, I had the start input closed and we look at some of the other elements, the draw, the update and so on. Um, and so now I just want to look at this one part that we skipped over. Uh, but just to keep in, in mind, when did we call this method start input? We called it on our init. And remember our init was just another constructor, our second constructor that we call after the page is loaded so we can interact with the page after the page is loaded. So after the page is loaded, we call start input. And again, one of the reasons we want to call start input after the page is loaded is as we're going to see here in a second, we're going to add these listeners to the canvas. And if the canvas hasn't been loaded yet, uh, we'll get an error when we try and add an event to it. So uh, an event listener. So uh, that's one of the reasons why we delay calling start input. We don't call it in our constructor. We call it in the init, which we don't call until after the web page has loaded. All right, now let's look at what we're doing in the start input. Now all start input is going to do is load the listeners that are going to listen for the input that we expect from our user. Now, there are a couple ways you could do this. Uh, some ways are maybe considered better or maybe better style than others. And so I want to highlight a little bit about some of the choices I've made here. So one thing we can do, if you've looked at some other web de development out there, you might have got some advice that says you can add listeners right to the whole window, the browser, something that's sort of a higher level object or document. That means anytime you press the key, whether you're focused on the game at the canvas itself, which is the game, uh, or on some other element, you would still capture that keyboard input and, and use it for the game. Now, usually that's not the style that we want. If you, if you have other elements on the web page that you want your user to be able to interact with, uh, for instance, on my web page, I have a little debug uh, checkbox that you can click uh, on or off. Uh, I don't want when you're clicking on that for that input to impact the game in any way. So I only want the, the inputs that are targeted at the game to be captured by the game. Now, how do I know that the input is going to be targeted at the game? Well, the goal here is, is to say that that input would be targeted at the canvas because the canvas element is the element, element that has the game in it. Now, let's take a moment to talk a little bit about focus in a web page in case you're not familiar. So uh, the normal time when you might be used the normal time when you might be used to using focus in a web page is say you're entering in some kind of web form. You're entering your name, your password, your you know your address, your phone number, whatever it might be. You're entering in your personal information in some web form. Each of the little input boxes where you tab through first name, last name, and so on, each of those you move the focus as you move from one box to the next. And in fact, a common way that you will move your focus from one box to another, at least if you're familiar with it, is by pressing the tab key. And in fact, if you want one of your elements on your page to be able to be tabbed to, um, you can set its tab index. Now the tab index, this is what I've got highlighted here, will tell you where in the list of tabbing you are. So if you want to change the order at which you can tab around through different elements in your uh, web page, you can modify these tab indexes and that will change the order that you would go through when you're tabbing. Now, the canvas element is not normally an element that you sh can put into focus and that's because normally it's only intended to be an output element. It's a it's a, for drawing something, it's for drawing some kind of images and so on. However, we're using it also as an input element. We're going to want to be able to capture inputs and because it's not normally something that we put input into, like a checkbox or input text box, we have to set it up and tell the web page that we want to be able to focus on this element. 
And so by giving it a tab index, we're telling it, hey, we want to be able to focus on you. Now, the other key tag that I put here, and you might see this already, is I've added this auto focus. This is another tag that we can add uh, to our canvas element, which is going to ensure that when we enter the web page, we are focused on the canvas and we're not focused on some other element. And that way, uh, we're already going to be ready to capture input. If this were not already the case, then if our uh, user uh, wanted to use the input, they would have to first click on the canvas element in the same way you would click on a text input box to enter in your name or your password and so on. And so in this case, this is set it up so that at least if they're not clicking elsewhere on, on the screen, that when they enter the web page, they will automatically be focused on the canvas and be able to play the game. If they then click off and uh, click on say my debug, my little debug checkbox, uh, they might have to click back onto the canvas to make sure that it's in focus. So this is just a little bit about uh, being in focus. But now once the canvas say is in focus, then we can listen for any of the inputs that are then targeted at that canvas. Anything that happens while we're focused on the canvas, we can capture that input. What do I mean anything that happens? Well, maybe clicks, maybe we move the mouse around, maybe we uh, press keyboard uh, keys. And that's what I want to focus on in this video is how do we capture those keyboard keys? Now, one thing we can see here is that this key down event is the first thing that we're going to be listening for. Now, when we talk about keyboards, there are going to be three kinds of events that you might want to listen for. Key down, which is what we're looking at here, key up, which you can see down below there, or key press. Key press is actually one of the events that I no longer use very much. It's very similar to key down, but I find key down and key up to be much more uh, intuitive when I'm detecting keyboard input myself. And so I'm actually going to use key down and key up. I'm going to listen to these two events, and then I'm going to be sensitive to the keys that I care about which are specifically at least the ones that I've got set up right now, left, right, up, down, arrow, key A, D, W, S, and the Z and the X key. And in a second here, I'll tell you a little bit more why I've made those choices and, and maybe I'll add a little bit to this as well. Now, what's going to happen when we uh, execute this line here, this line is going to go to the canvas, add a listener, a listener is a function. So as you can see here, there's a function we're passing in here and it's going to listen for the key down event. Whenever the key down event is triggered, no matter which key it is, it will call this function and it will pass in the event to the function. And so for the second here, I just want to do something. I'm going to do console.log e. This is sort of a fun thing to do. Let's go out here. So what we can see here is that when I when I press the keyboard then uh, it fired off this keyboard event, and remember when you console.log an object like this, it will tell you what kind of object it is. So this is a keyboard event object, and we can now go and look inside it. There's a lot of actual interesting properties and fields that we might want to check for the keyboard event. Uh, specifically, uh, some of them might tell us what, what character code we might be getting. So key A is one code that you'll see that I'm using. Uh, a just tells us that it is the lowercase a coming in. Um, we might also want to look for certain characteristics like what's the control key currently being held? Is this control A or alt A? And as you might expect, shift as well, which tells you the key code. We usually use key code now as a, as a, a better term, but which character would tell you which character it was using the ASCII key code. Well, now we can actually just ask it for the key code and it will tell us what it was. And that's usually the way that we're going to detect either by key code or by code, which is sort of a, a more user friendly way of detecting, well, which code was it? Which key was pressed? Is it the one that I'm interested in? And again, all of these other things you might be interested in as well. I usually ignore them. Uh, but this is just to let you know what you could dig into that keyboard event and find inside of it. And again, we're not really looking at too much of it. So when I used it here, I actually used it to just look at the code, as I mentioned. So I'm going to take this line out and we're going to see here, what do I do with that code? Well, I, I pass it into a switch statement. So hopefully we're familiar with switch statements. It's basically a large if then 
uh, branch. And I've actually got uh, a little bit of redundancy built in here. Uh, if you're familiar with, you know, uh, gaming, then you know that uh, the arrow keys are commonly used for moving around, and, and that's what we're going to be using for moving Mario in my example as well. But also it's very common to use the AS, D, and W keys as though they are secondary arrow keys. And so I decided when I was going to set up my initial keyboard input that I might want to do arrows or the ASDW setup. So I decided to set it up like this. And of course, this is a, the, the setup that says if you're in this case, arrow, arrow left, just fall down into, into this case. So these two cases are being treated exactly the same way, which is what am I going to do in that case? All I'm going to do is set a property of my game engine that is, I'm calling it left for left arrow or moving left or whatever you would like. Uh, and I'm setting it to be true. Now, I want, I'm doing this again also for my right. I've got a right property. I've got an up property. I've got a down property. I've got an A and a B property. Now, the reason why I've chosen these specific properties for my game engine and for my control is I'm trying to simulate an original Nintendo Entertainment System game controller exclusively and exactly. And now those original game controllers had a D-pad, which is a direction pad that had up, down, left, right. So those were those first four. And then it had exactly two buttons called A and B. And so I've decided to call those two buttons here A and B. Now, they were backwards on the keyboard, which is why I put them backwards here as well. Uh, and, and that's just because, again, I'm trying to simulate that exact same uh, uh, game controller setup that we had in the original game. Now, you might want to have a different kind of setup. You might want to have different keys. You might need more than just A and B. You might need your X and your Y if you're thinking a more modern controller as well. And that's fine. You can implement that as, as well. Now, a couple other things that I chose to do is I chose to make my B and my A, also keyboard keys, Z and X. Now, my initial setup here was I wanted to make this Alt and Space, but then I realized, well, the way that Alt interacts with things and the way that Space interacts with things, it's actually going to be a little bit easier to just use Z and X. And then I thought, well, why don't we actually set up, since, since using Z and X as my keys while using A, S, D, and W, that would be a little bit you know, cramped on my hand unless you got some good StarCraft micro skills, something like that. So I'm going to move over and I'm going to say, why not do uh, add the comma and the, the period as two more keys we can use for my B and my A. Now to do that, I'm going to have to go and look for the character codes for comma and period because I don't know what they are. So to figure this out, I went to key code info has a fun little input box where you can just press any key and it will tell you what the key code is. So I just did comma and I did period, comma and period, and it will tell you things like the key, but the code was what I was looking up here. Um, remember which I told you, it tells you here it's deprecated, uh, but this is the old fashioned way of doing things. But here period is just called period. That's maybe what I should have expected. And comma is just called comma. So that means I can go here and do a cut, cut and paste and let's see, key Z, that was B. I think I kind of want to set this, keep the same arrangement over here. So that would be comma. And then I'll maybe do one here as well and call that one period. And now I should have my setup to detect my uh, comma and my period as well. Now I've set this up only on my key down. This is going to set my properties to true. But on key up, I'm going to want to reset them back to false. So I want to detect when I'm no longer pressing the key. So I didn't set that up here. So let's do that again, comma and period. Okay. Now, what you'll notice here also in, in this particular design pattern, you'll see that I'm choosing not to say what these are going to be used for. Are these going to be used for jumping or running and shooting fireballs and so on? No, I'm just calling them by their actual input names as though there was a controller there and then I'm going to let the entities themselves interpret these signals as needed. So specifically the only entity that really needs to interpret these signals is Mario. Now Mario's logic is a little bit more complex and I'm going to go into more details about that when we start talking about collision detection. But at the moment I want to just show how we can capture those inputs as they were pressed by the user and just respond to them in some 
realistic or reasonable way. Now, the way that I want to do that, again, is in response to just pressing them, I want to highlight these, these little simulated keys I put up there, A's, B's, left, right, up and down, to just show which button I'm pressing at what time. So I'm just gonna show you how I set up this little debugging output up here, and then we'll worry about how we control Mario with them a little bit later. So the main thing I've done here is I've put a little bit of effort into drawing some squares and, and writing a letter like left here. This will draw a little square, a rectangle. This will draw the letter left. And the only thing that I've got here is I've got a little conditional here that's saying, hey, if game.left, now remember that was the property that we set up in the game engine that would be true if the left arrow or the A key were being pressed. If it were being pressed, then what? Then this will be true. Then this will say that my stroke style will be white and my fill style is set to my stroke style so it will also be white. Otherwise, it's going to default to gray, meaning if I'm not pressing left, then the stroke style and fill style will both be gray. So hopefully what that means is this little box and this little L that I've drawn here will be white when I press it and gray when I don't. Likewise, I've set up the exact same pattern for down, up, right, and the A and the B. I just switched them to circles uh, for aesthetics in that case. I'm being careful at the end here to make sure I change things back. I should do that to my fill style as well. Uh, because next time I want to draw something, a rectangle or some text, I want to make sure that it, it is set back to the color it was before, which was white. Now, of course, if I'm being careful before I draw something the next time, I should set my stroke style and my fill style to the color that I would want it to be. So in this video, I have shown you how to capture keyboard input on a HTML5 canvas element. And I've also shown you how to respond to that keyboard input with some kind of graphical output. Thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you in the next video.